Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Who is that? Doshi. Yeah, Doshi. Yeah. Okay, yes. Nice to see so many of you on here and everybody coming on time, which is good. I'm in. Yeah, yeah good evening, everybody. Good um, evening to you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. So, yeah, while you're all waiting, do make sure you grab some paper and pen. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Alaikum salam. Alaikum salam, everybody. And we're connecting people from all over the world. I just had a fitness class, and we had one lady from Canada, one lady from America, one lady from Saudi Arabia on there because it was on Zoom. So that was absolutely amazing. Okay, I think that will start now. Okay, so assalamu alaikum everybody and thank you very much for coming today. Welcome to our child protection and safeguarding training today, which is for everybody. Um, we've got health professionals on here, we've got people from the educational sector as well. And as well as that, we've got imams on here from mosques and madrasas and also teaching staff for mosques and madrasas or Islamic schools as well. So we've got a great mixture here today, which means that we'll also be looking at child protection issues very specific to Muslims because of our uh, Islamic audience as well. This is training which I do every two years, and it's always done in Ikra Learning Center, and obviously everybody who ever attends has to go there. But this year, because of Zoom, I thought I would open it up to everybody, uh, whoever wanted to come. It was the first hundred who registered. And um, you are one of the lucky hundred, really, who got in for this, because I had a lot of interest in this. It is good to make notes. So if you haven't grabbed some paper and pen, do get that and make some notes so that you can remember. There will be a lot of information. Um, this talk will be recorded and it will go on YouTube because I've got other educational programs on there, which you can then access and get specific slides because you can actually snap shot and take photos of slides nowadays as well from your mobile. Right, I think we will now start. Okay, so this is last year's training on, uh, on the picture that you can see which is on my YouTube channel, which is very basic, which you can access. But today's one is actually going to be a lot more advanced because there's going to be a lot more topics um, that I have included. So today's one actually includes the latest topics like sexting, grooming, child sexual exploitation, human trafficking, gang culture, which we're looking at knife crime culture in particular, but also sexual slavery and things like that as well. Um, and um, I will also be looking at how to identify signs, identify signs and symptoms of possible abuse, assessing the risk as well, all the internal procedures as well that are in different places because it's different according to where you work. We will also be looking at child protection reporting procedures, how to do that. Again, it will be different in each area. So I have researched a little bit on how, how each sector, medical or health or um, schools or educational, how they report um, uh, someone who needs child protection. And like I said before, we, I have updated the training and it will include all the online issues as well which is rife at the moment, okay? Um, you will also know how to report procedures, how to actually talk to the children about any concerns because there are ways of asking um, the children and um, also how to record the information as well. So just in case you're wondering why on earth is that woman doing it, um, I have got quite a lot of background in this. I am actually a qualified teacher. I am a special educational needs coordinator, which means I'm specialized uh, with a further degree in uh, special educational, social and emotional mental health and wellbeing needs. And I have over 23 years of being a special educational needs 
coordinator, where I was also in charge of looked after children um, who had been taken into care because of safeguarding issues. So I know about all the procedures. I always gave um, all the training as well in my workplace and in the whole of Essex as well at many times. So here's just a bit about me. I used to arrange, chair and host Brentwood schools. That's all the schools in Brentwood, uh, the Senko cluster meetings. Those of you who are teachers will know what Senko is. I trained other new Senkos in Essex. I was the vice chair on the Brentwood behavior attendance and pastoral meetings. I used to run parenting courses on behavior, mental health and emotional development in children. I represent primary Senkos for Essex County Council, which is where I live and, and used to work. Um, I regularly give lectures on special educational needs and disabilities and mental health at conferences and universities. I lecture in special educational needs modules of childhood and behaviour studies degrees at university. I'm the Secretary of Essex Mind and Spirit, which is in a voluntary organisation that deals with mental health and how mental health can recover through faith. And I am a chaplain at college, university, in a hospice, Blue Water Shopping Centre and hospital as well. So I have got quite a lot of hats um, and I was on the senior management team when I worked in school as well. Okay, right, let us now have a look at the definition of safeguarding. What is it? <laughs> So safeguarding and welfare of children is everyone's responsibility. Anyone who comes into contact with children and their families has a role to play in safeguarding children. Everyone who comes in contact with children are important as they can identify concerns early and help children to prevent concerns escalating. All staff, did you know, have a responsibility to provide a safe environment in which children can learn. And that definition is actually in uh, the Keeping Children Safe in Education DOE document 2018. Um, that definition is the same across the board. And the information that I give to you today is actually going to be compatible with all areas of work. So I may at times talk about school but the information that you get, you can apply that to each and every one of the workplace. Okay, um, there are four types of child abuse. Okay, so I'd like um, this to be interactive. So if anybody can unmute and tell me what <coughs> one type of child abuse is that you may know of. Physical. Physical, good. Physical That's is true. Important. Let's, so physical abuse is the first one. I think a brother gave that one. So that is excellent. The first one is physical abuse. Okay. Now there is what? Uh, now let's look at three more. Emotional abuse. Yes, emotional abuse is coming up as well in a minute. Let's. What about the other two? Verbal abuse. Sexual abuse. Sexual abuse is the second one. Correct. Emotional mm -hmm. abuse is correct. These are the categories we're looking at. So then within the categories, we will look at emotional abuse. Yes. And there's one more. Neglect. Neglect. Well done, sister. That was excellent. So neglect is the fourth category. Okay. Now, who can tell me why all of these four types of abuse are more with people who have either got special educational needs or disabilities, or are looked after children, or have got mental health problems. Why is it more rife amongst those? There's two main reasons, three main reasons. Because they're vulnerable. They're vulnerable. Yep, one is they are more vulnerable. Good. Any more? Because they're unstable. Instability. Pardon? Because the back part is not stable. Yep, their background may not be stable, so they lack confidence, mm -hmm. okay? Um, they may not always be able to tell other people that they're being abused. 
Excellent. That's the third answer I was looking for. Well done. Some clever people in the audience today. Also, for example, say they're autistic. They may not realise that what's happening with them is abuse. Does that make sense? So they may not then report it. Yes. Well, that's normal in everyday life. It also depends on how much have you come across, you see. You may think that what happens in your house is normal, you see. So it's very important that vulnerable people mix with other people as much as possible, different kinds of people, to understand that what's happening with them is not normal and have friends and talk to other family members as well. It's important that all children or adults, because all of these abuse can actually happen at the adult level as well. So I will at some stage, I will be talking about adults as well. All of these things can happen also um, within marriages, for example, as well. So it does happen. Um, and um, it's important that everybody has wide experience, have friends and family where they can understand that what's happening with them is actually wrong. Okay. So these are the four categories. I want you to note these four down. That's very important you put those on your paper. And then inside all of these categories, there are lots and lots, lots of different kinds of abuse and safeguarding issues, which we are going to talk about some of them today. Okay, so we've got bullying, including cyberbullying, which is the latest one. That is quite rife amongst the Muslim community, thanks to Islamophobia. Domestic violence um, is another one. And... Um, we will, again, like I said, we've got a lot all Muslims on here today, so we are going to talk about some of the things in relation to Muslims as well. And then we've got drugs, suicidal ideation, sexting, which we are definitely going to talk about because it's rife because of the culture, the IT culture. Female genital mutilation is another very big one amongst the government, and a lot of doctors will come across that one. Forced marriages, which we are going to distinguish between a forced marriage and an arranged marriage, because there's a big difference there, which people get mixed up with, children get mixed up with that one. Child sexual exploitation is another quite a new term. Mental health as well, which is actually rife out there. One in four people that have now were days got mental health. We're going to talk about neglect, relationship abuse within teenagers, maybe a little bit amongst adults as well high-risk behaviours, aggression, self-harm, okay? Now, most of those are navy blue on that list, but the coloured ones, so there are five coloured ones, those are more to do, can be more to do with Islam, okay? Maybe more related to Islam. So we will look at those as well, since everybody on here is Muslim, okay? Now let us look at the definition of abuse. So we're going to do things one step at a time. Here is the defini definition of abuse. Harm can be suffered by a child by acts of abuse perpetrated on them by others. Abuse can happen in any family, but children are more at risk if their parents have been taking drugs, alcohol, or have mental health or domestic abuse problems. Abuse can also occur outside of the family home. Evidence shows children with disabilities are more vulnerable to suffering abuse. And I have mentioned that before. That's not just disabilities. It's also looked after children. It's also children who've got special educational needs or mental health as well. Okay, so we are now going to look at each category, each type of abuse. And we're going to look at the definition first and then the symptoms okay so the first one on my chart i showed you earlier was physical abuse okay now some of you may look at that picture and that may be familiar to you as a child okay which may have been used by your mums as a disciplinary in those days it was not in law and Parents were allowed to be assertive and put boundaries on their children. And in the days when I grew up, that was quite common. And it was there, you know, to put boundaries. But however, nowadays it's against the law. 
So anything that leaves a mark, you're not allowed. And that's across the board in Islam as well. Yes, discipline is allowed okay, uh, in Islam. You have to in order to keep everybody on the straight path, the children. But anything that leaves a mark then is even in Islam regarded as physical violence. So here is the term explained. Physical abuse is deliberately hurting a child. So notice the word deliberately. Okay, it may take different forms, e.g. hitting, biting, pinching, shaking, throwing, poisoning, burning, or scalding, drowning, or even suffocating a child. So, um, for example, there was a child in my school. She was looked after in the end. She was taken away from her parents. But um, when she used to do pee, she would have cigarette burns on her body. And um, the teacher spotted the cigarette burns and then called me in to have a look. Um, and the dad we know was a heavy smoker and her book bag used to stink of cigarettes. So even if the dad said, oh no, I don't smoke, there are clues that can give you, that, that, that things can give you to show that actually that's not true. Because her book bag, her clothes used to absolutely stink of cigarettes. So that then showed us that there was something happening at home to do with cigarettes there was smoking going on um, and then later on that child was actually taken away from their par uh, from, uh, her parents so um, these are some of the signs that you need to look for really domestic violence is a form of physical abuse um, and believe it or not this can even happen within couples and then children can either end up doing it or couples who have not got a good relationship with each other and are always physically violent with each other, they can actually take out their anger on the children as well. So, um, it, you know, it's very, very important that physical violence is actually stopped. Um, there is actually a paper which talks about stopping domestic and sexual violence abuse. In 2016, it came out and um, teachers need to have the necessary skills really to uh, look and see if any domestic violence is actually happening um, within um, households. Teachers also need to be alerted if any pupils are experiencing distress, all of that kind of stuff I will talk about later on how to do things. So domestic violence is threatening, controlling, coercive behaviour violence or abuse that can be psychological, virtual, physical, verbal, sexual, financial or emotional, inflicted on anyone irrespective of age, ethnicity, religion, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation or any form of disability by a current or former intimate partner, or family member as well. So this is where I'm looking at adults as well. So it's very, very important that um, you look really for the physical signs, really when it comes to physical violence is what, what we're on, physical abuse. <laughs> okay, when somebody is being physically abused, the marks you see on their body are not typical places where you will see marks on a child's body. So for example, when they're playing on the playground, it is their joints where you will see the marks, like their knees or their elbows. Um, but you won't normally see marks in other places. For example, the inside of their thighs, would you, if, if a child is, has fallen in the playground? So keep an eye on that. Also, recurring um, breakages. So for example, there was actually a mother at school where I worked. One day she came in with a broken nose and she said she fell down and her nose was fine. And after a couple of weeks, her um, arm was actually in a sling. And that was the next thing. Um, and then in another couple of weeks, it was something else. It was her eye, her actual eye was actually had a big bruise around it. So there is, was a big problem obviously at home, domestic violence. Then later on we did find out that her 
partner then went to prison for domestic violence. So it's recurring and doctors, for example, need to keep an eye that is when a child comes in and needs medication, is it quite common that different parts of the body, every time it's a different part of the body, or pharmacists, for example, they also need to check. Is their medicine going out each time, recurring to the same person? Ch children recover very quickly from illnesses as well. So if, if this is recurring, then it, it's basically an alarm bell. Okay, so here are the physical indicators. Notice you can see a shoe there. Some of you will also um, be familiar with that, a device used by Punjabi parents. Um, in those days, like I said, it was not in the law, um, you know, and even non-Muslim children got the slipper here and there. In fact, slippers were given in school as well. Imams as well, they would also use a shoe, you know. Nowadays, it's against the law, so um, any imams out there um, who are on this today need to be very, very careful the way you discipline children because it is in the law where you are not allowed to touch a child, not just with a shoe, but of any other device. A whip, for example, is one as well, um, you know, uh, that, that was used in, in my days anyway when I was growing up. So let's look at the physical indicators. Scratches, bite marks, bruises in places difficult to mark, for example, behind ears. You would not get that if you fell down, for example. Burns, which is, I mentioned about the cigarette burns earlier. Untreated injuries, so open wounds, a plaster hasn't been put on, a bandage hasn't been put on. That shows neglect as well. And then some behavioral indicators. So self-mutilation tendencies. So by self-mutilation, we're looking at um, a form of sort of self-harming. That's what we mean there. Um, aggressive or withdrawn, or for example, they may get violent when they go home. Um, fear of returning home. Oh my gosh, we used to get this girl and she used to wet herself actually at home time uh, because she was scared of going home because at home her mum and dad used to hit each other and she was scared of going home. She did not want to see them beating each other up. Undue fear of adults, that's the one that I mentioned, that all of a sudden someone gets angry and they get really scared. That shows that some kind of abuse is definitely um, going on there. When somebody comes up to them, they get really scared. So I used to get this sometimes in school where a teacher would shout at the child and he would completely retaliate, thinking, oh my God, what's he going to do? Put his hands out like someone's about to hit him. That was actually another dead giveaway as well. Retaliation could be like someone's about to hit him or overreacting, oh, please, miss, please don't do anything to me. There's another problem there because that's probably what happens at home. And fearful watchfulness, always on the watchfulness that, oh gosh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to me? Okay, we will talk a little bit about anxiety later as well. So here are all the places where um, you may see physical abuse signs. Okay, so we've got strangle marks. We've got bruising around the eye that you don't normally get from falling down. Um, inner thighs as well, upper or inner thighs, you don't usually get that when you fall down. Genitals bruising around there, that could actually show sexual abuse as well, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, around the mouth, we've got skull fractures there. Um, the triangle of safety is a really good one, so ears, side of faces, neck and top of shoulders. Accidental injuries in this area are unusual. Okay, so make a note of those triangular ones there as well. Okay, now the other one which is to do with your body and is a very, quite a latest one is female genital mutilation. Okay, now um, this can be more rife in 
Islamic countries. Now, I'll tell you why that is before everyone jumps down my throat and says, no, no, that's not true. The reason is, in Islam, a child is expected to be a virgin at the time of marriage. Okay? So, what Muslims do usually is to educate their child so that they practice modesty to be safe okay um and then what happens in some countries and it is in eastern european countries some of them like chechnya have come across and also some african countries is regardless of looking at what the religion says they ensure that their child is completely protected against losing their virginity so what they do is they sew up that area okay so penetration is cannot doesn't can't be done full stop okay that causes many many infections and it is completely haram in islam to do that does anybody know why it's haram why is it haram to sew your body up because it's harmful for the body it is you're harming your body aren't you okay by sewing it up then did you know that a slit needs to be put there when you get married and then uh, intimate relationships are very very painful and in uk it is actually illegal now to um have female genital mutilation done completely illegal it's always done to muslim girls it has huge psychological consequences as well as physical infections and all sorts so be careful doctors is a really good one to look at for this one and pharmacists for example if somebody comes in a pharmacy and asks for some kind of infectious medicine for a girl a young young girl and then keeps coming back for it there is alarm bells there okay um urine infections and stuff is quite normal but having other kinds of infections down there is not normal for a young child who is not intimate yet marriageable age if you know what i mean okay so it is a crime nowadays so female genital cutting and female circumcision all procedures that involve partial or total removal of the external female genitalia or other injury to the female genital organs for non-medical reasons that is the criteria okay and it's not allowed okay other forms of physical abuse includes gangs and youth violence who knows the latest type of gang and youth violence which is out there which is actually to do with physical aggression knife crime knife crime good well done so young people join gangs for lots of different reasons which can include feeling part of something or having a feeling of belonging so again vulnerable vulnerable people feeling respected and important to be protected from bullying or other gangs making money from crime or drugs um, gaining status and feeling powerful and knife crime did you know started rising by 22% in 2017 and now it is hugely on the rise hugely um, and it's actually happening amongst Muslims as well um, especially in some of the deprived areas like East London so we need to be careful we need to look out for marks of knives but we also need to look out for children who have joined gangs who are into knife crime and things as well and that also definitely needs to be reported I will talk a little bit more about gang culture later and grooming under the sexual category okay right who can now tell me what the second um type of abuse was that we did on that chart earlier sexual, sexual abuse it was sexual abuse and then there was another one emotional emotional so i'm going to do emotional emotional yes i'm going to do emotional next okay now emotional abuse is more harmful than physical abuse why is that any 
because it has an it, it has a mental impact on the person. It does. It has a mental impact on a person. Um, there are no physical signs, so it's kind of hard to detect. Good. That's the answer I'm looking for. With emotional abuse, you can't see it. Okay. It's all in the mind, and emotional abuse is more harmful. Uh, because you know what it scars? It scars your soul. It doesn't scar your body, it scars your soul. Okay? Emotional abuse can happen at any time, whether you're a child or whether you are an adult as well. Okay? Within marriage as well, emotional abuse can happen. So it's very important really to be able to spot the signs. Okay. So let us have a look. What is emotional abuse? Persistent emotional maltreatment of a child or an adult. Okay. Psychological abuse can have severe effects on a child's emotional development. Emotional abuse involves deliberately telling a child that they are worthless or unloved and in, inadequate. It may include not giving a child opportunities to express their views, deliberately silencing them, or even making fun of what they've got to say or fun of what they've got to do, okay? And even how they communicate sometimes, that's including body language as well, um, as well as um, how they sit and stand or walk. Emotional abuse may involve bullying as well, including online bullying through social networks. As you've noticed, I've added in a lot of online stuff in this training today because that is the latest, isn't it, the latest phrase. Online bullying through social networks and it can also happen through games as well and even through mobile phones by a child's peers as well as anybody at home as well, okay? Um, I did mention emotional abuse can happen at any age, even with adults. So I have got um, some emotionally abusive signs within a relationship. You walk on eggshells to avoid upsetting your partner. Your feelings and opinions are rarely validated. Your partner is mistrustful of you for no reason. You feel like you are unable to discuss problems in the relationship or discuss many, many things because of the reaction that they may give. You also feel stuck or confused most of the time. Um, people need to give others the environment really to speak, to be able to want to talk to them really, okay? And it's also the way you say things as well can also be emotional abuse, the way, the, the tone of your voice or shouting out, okay, all of that uh, persistently then results in uh, going into the category of emotional abuse. How do you know when a person is manipulating you? They will use guilt to get you to do things for them. Sometimes they may over flatter you in a way that does not seem sincere. When you confront them with something they did wrong, they tell you something you did wrong in the past and they take the focus of what they did and onto what you did. They use your words against you, they twist everything you say to their benefit and you find yourself defending yourself while they are off the book. They are cold or distant and they take away things when you don't do what they want you to do. That's all emotional abuse as well. They do or say horrible things and then they say it's a joke or you are too sensitive and that is not what they meant. And that is actually from a psychology journal there, okay? And within marriages, you can also get toxic relationships and you can also be living in a toxic environment, okay? And I'm not gonna go through this one in detail because we're mainly looking at children today, but we're looking at narcissistic behavior so things like drama, lots of drama there every time, you feel trapped, you're on eggshells the whole time, there's no respect for you, nothing is ever good enough, there's no compromising at all, you always seem to be doing things and not, you know, always giving in and apologizing. There's no positive emotions or very little or negative, people are always judging you, always bad temperedness around, 
nobody values you, uh, you're put down in arguments, you're not at your best with those people, um, you give more than what you take, uh, they isolate you from your family and friends. That's exactly what bullying does as well. They isolate you so you can't find out what is actually happening. Um, so you don't know the truth or you can't compare their behavior with anybody else. Lack of compromise as well, manipulation. They try to change you into a different person with different qualities. Okay, so those are some for adults because child protection is not just for children, it's for adults as well. Okay, I will talk about reporting procedures later. Um, another type of emotional abuse is um, installing limiting beliefs in your child. Now, I did a whole program on limiting beliefs just on Friday. I was on the Islam channel. Um, it, uh, it, that will get posted on my channel in a couple of days as soon as I get the program from them. And um, limiting beliefs is, some, is emotional abuse, actually. It's where you drum things into the children and they actually believe it. So it could be anything. You could say, oh, you're, you're not good at this. You're no good at social skills or um, you're no good at this, for example, whatever, whatever. And the child believes you and then it limits them in life because they don't do those things. They're scared to do those things. That is a form of emotional abuse. And that is actually a brand new one. So do write that one down, please, on your list. Okay, the next one is also emotional abuse, honor-based violence. This is rife and this is actually in now English law, okay? Now, forced marriages are different from arranged marriages, okay? This is very important to understand this because some children have actually reported that they're being forced into marriage when actually the mum and dad have only introduced a partner to them. So we do need to be very, very careful. Um, an arranged marriage is where the parents choose a spouse for the children, and then it's only with the children's consent that the marriage takes place, okay? Forced marriages are un-Islamic. Who can tell me two things that are clearly there in Islam to show us that we're not to force the girl. Two reasons I want you to give me, please. Let's have one first. What is in Islam that makes sure that a girl is not forced? The woman has to give consent. Yes. When? First or second? First. First. How many times does she have to say it? Three. Three times. Three. Three times, they mom us again and again. Do you want to marry so and so? She says yes. Then he says, I'm going to ask you again. No. I went to a wedding, obviously, it was before lockdown, um, and their mom was brilliant. He did it all in English so she could understand. He asked her once, she said yes. Then he said, Now, in front of everybody, I'm going to ask you for the second time. And he put up two fingers do you want to marry this man and again she said yes and then he said now i'm going to ask you for the third time are you sure you want to marry this man and then she said yes so how is that forced okay the other one is a tricky one who else knows what the other thing that was put in islam how we know it's not forced and we can't force a girl the vanage is void, by the way, if she says no on any of those three occasions, and she's asked first. Forget the man, he's asked last. It's the woman they ask, just in case she's being forced. Okay, what's the other one, please? Does anybody know? Body language? A uh, girl will, will stay quiet if they're virgin. If they are quiet, then that means a yes in Islam. Okay? If they stay quiet, it means it's a yes in Islam because there are narrations where the Prophet Muhammad said that, you know, she's shy. Okay. Um, you know, it's modesty, isn't it? But there's another one. Uh, the other one is that 
No, people don't know this one, but I know because it happened on my wedding. <laughs> so um, I was really, really confused at the time uh, when my nikah was happening and my dad was standing there all quiet and he didn't say not a word. And it was actually someone else unknown who I didn't even know who was asking me. Why does that happen in some? And why is it not the father asking the girl? Anybody know this one? Why is it the it has, to, it has to be a third party doing the asking? Yes, but why? The father could be forcing her. The father could be forcing her. He could have a gun right behind her back and saying, marry, marry him. Okay. The father could have forced her and she's going to be scared of her dad. With an outsider, she is more likely to say, no, no, please, no, don't do this for me. Okay. So um this is the reason. And I didn't know this until I got married and I was shocked. I thought, I can't believe my dad's just standing there just quietly. Why is this unknown man who I didn't even know who it was, believe, me, believe it or not, asking me? So that is a very, very interesting one, which a lot of people do not know. Okay. Um, so let's look at what honor-based violence is first. The terms honor-based violence embrace a variety of crimes of violence, many against women including assault, imprisonment and murder, where the person is being punished by their family or community. Does anybody know why forced marriages started off in the first place? Let's see if some of you are clever enough. I'm focusing this one because I said I would focus on Islam as well as some of these. Why did it start happening? Why did people start forcing their girls to marry certain people and no other? To keep the families together, to keep it yes. within the family. Correct, correct. Well done. Yes, to keep the family lineage going. Okay, they want to keep it within the family. So they will force you to marry, for example, a cousin. The other one is to keep the money in the family. Okay, uh, our family, we own this much land and we are going to choose this man who has also got this much land so we can keep the richness in the family, okay? This is how it all started and caste systems. Now, especially Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, a lot of customs have come from Hindu culture and it's the culture not in their religion either, uh, even though they do have caste systems in the olden days. So people were forced, a Brahma girl can only marry a Brahma caste to keep that status as well, okay? It can even be for colour as well, keep them within this. Because I know a Chechnyan girl um, at university and she said that uh, they don't marry outside of the village, let alone marry out of the country, because they keep their Chechnyan tribes. So this is why it all happens. So you need to look at the background of the girl. Is she from a remote village back home where, yes, it is more likely that kind of stuff will happen. Um, has she got a lot of cousins, things like that. According to law, it's not allowed. Okay, it is actually in the law. Honor based violence is actually in the law at the moment. Um, but girls as well need to be careful. Uh, an arranged marriage is different to honor based uh, violence. And did you know also that uh, even in this country, right until recently the royal family we now married within their own families but they're not okay within the royal family it's only in recent times that people have left that uh, social hierarchy um in victorian times people married within aristocrats aristocrats married within aristocrats it was in this country as well in the olden days okay let's look at the indicators now of emotional abuse okay so physical indicators are sudden speech disorders like a stutter wetting and soiling now that's a very common one amongst children which also pharmacists can pick up and doctors so for example if uh, a young child is coming who's seven years old for nappies there's a question for a pharmacist to ask that how comes this child is not potty trained yet at the age of seven and again doctors 
when you're referring uh, to consultants for bedwetting and stuff, it's up to the doctor really to question in such a way to find out why is this child bedwetting at this age, okay? Um, there's just examples, but even in madrasas you can pick it up as well. If the, the, the child is smelling of urine constantly, things like that. Signs of mutilation, that's self-harming, that is big time nowadays, especially amongst the teenagers. But when I was in primary school, I actually saw it there. And it may not just be cutting yourself. We had one boy who would take out his eyelashes. That is a form of uh, mutilation as well. Okay. Um, frequent vomiting. Again, that's like bulimia, isn't it? There's definite uh, abuse going on there. Frequent vomiting is like bulimia. And then let's look at the behavioural indicators now. So rocking, thumb sucking is another one you get a lot in children. Um, they bite their nails. There was one child and her nails were so short you could actually see the blood from under the nails. So she would constantly bite her nails. Fear of change is one. Chronic runaway. That means they try to run away because they don't want to go home. And poor peer relationships is another one. Another one is seeking attention. So the picture you can see is a child trying to seek attention. That is another thing that you will see in emotional abuse. They will also always show some form of anxiety. The only thing I'm going to mention here is that mainly adults look for the major signs of anxiety, okay? But you must also look at some of the lighter signs of anxiety. And some of those are things like overthinking, memory issues, avoidance, okay? They are minor signs, lack of patience as well. Um, these are minor signs because there are different levels of anxiety. Um, constantly worrying, overthinking, needing reassurance is another one. Okay, right. Which other form of abuse is this? So I've done physical and I've done emotional. What's the third one I mentioned earlier? Sexual abuse. Sexual, sexual abuse is a very big one and it's actually becoming more and more rife out there. And more and more younger, it's happening as well. And the children are more aware younger. This is one of the reasons why they introduced actually knowledge of sexual relationships and things into the curriculum at a young age, so that the children are aware when sexual abuse is happening as well. Um, so here is what the definition is occurs when others use and exploit children sexually for their own gain or the gain of others. Sexual abuse may involve physical contact, including assault by penetration, rape, or non-penetrative acts. The non-penetrative acts can happen over the internet. Okay, um, these can be things like masturbation where um, People on the other line are trying to make you masturbate and will say or do things to instigate that process. Um, the other one has to happen face to face, so oral sex, um, kissing, rubbing, touching, even if it's outside of clothing. Okay, It may include non-contact -con activities, such as forcing children to produce sexual images of themselves. This happens quite a lot on Instagram and TikTok is the other new one out there. Um, forcing them to, to produce naked images of them so they can look at them. Or even watching sexual activities like pornography and stuff. Like Encouraging children to behave in sexually inappropriate ways and then grooming a child afterwards once they're caught up in that act. Okay, in preparation for abuse. 
Now, in schools, there is a programme called e-technology, which is out there, which a lot of parents are invited to, so that they can keep an eye on their children in case they are uh, engaging in these kinds of things. Um, imams that are on here, I think it is very important that you should try not to be in a room on your own with a girl in case somebody plants something on you, okay? And even online, you should make sure the mother is around in the room when you are teaching the girls. I think that is very important. I have come across quite a few imams who have been accused of all sorts nowadays, um, and it's not good really for their reputation. Either I feel that you should just do the same gender, teach the same gender, or have somebody else in the room, okay? So, a lot is happening, like I said, to do with sexual abuse. Um, mixed WhatsApp groups, which have got a huge audience, is what you need to look at with the child. Is the child on a group with lots of men? Um, and don't forget people can put up rude images and then delete them within an hour on whatsapp for example and then there's no evidence so that's something that needs to be kept an eye on and innocent children um, are going to be affected more okay so if somebody mentions any type of sexting in school or at the doctors for example when the doctor examines you know, a, a, a patient who's got pain, for example, in the lower end, then, you know, these are questions to be asked because there are signs nowadays which the perpetrator uses to try and grab sexual attention from the children. And um, these are some of them. And they may not be put in that way it's with the intention it's happening and the purpose. So, you know, some of you may get alarm bells, there's fruit on there, but that doesn't mean anything to someone like you and I. We could just be saying, oh, I ate a watermelon today and we could put a watermelon up. That's not the context. We're looking at a context where the opposite gender, okay, is talking to, for example, an innocent child, someone who's a lot older than them, teaching them things, okay? So here is some language here as well. Again, you can snapshot some of these slides from my YouTube channel when I upload the video. Um, and this is how grooming actually happens slowly. People get hooked on chatting sexual things on the internet. Um, and here is another chart which has got actual words in there. And these are actually some of the um, acronyms, if you like, or um, shorthand letters, which actually means something else much worse um, to offer sexual nature. Okay, and all of these things are then used to groom people. There are four stages to grooming targeting stage, the friendship forming stage, the loving relationship stage, and then comes the abusive relationship stage. This then leads to modern day slavery out of which sexual slavery is one of them, which happens where children, um, I actually know somebody that this happened to actually, she was in Eastern, Eastern Europe living there quietly and this man made friendships with her from England and he started grooming her slowly on the internet, making friends with her, then he started sending her presents, expensive presents, and he said, why don't you meet me in England? I will even pay for your passport and uh, get made and your visa and everything. So she fell in love with this man and she ended up coming to England. And as soon as she came, he put her in a, in a brothel, basically, and made money out of her. And um, very, very sad. She said she could not then return back to Eastern Europe because she had lost her virginity and where she lived in the tiny little village where she had never come across anybody outside of that village that's hence why she was innocent 
she um, couldn't go back there not being a virgin. They would kill her, she said. So this is how grooming happens. The most vulnerable children are the ones that are targeted. Um, grooming does not just happen for sexual relationships. We already know that uh, they can be targeted to join ISIS and things like that as well. So there are so many types of grooming for drugs as well. There's drugs as well. So these are all the latest things that you need to look for, which is why this training is very up to date. So exploitation can also be gang culture as well. Um, one idea is actually, for example, some of you may have gone to Saudi Arabia and you see lots of children and their hands are chopped off and they're begging out there. They have actually been captured, did you know, uh, and their hands have deliberately been chopped off so they can go around as beggars and beg for money. And then those children, they don't keep the money, they go back and give it to their bosses and then they eat that money. So that is a example of exploitation. So exploitation is intentional ill treatment, manipulation or abuse of power and control over a child to take selfish or unfair advantage of a child or situation for personal gain. It may manifest itself in forms such as child labor, slavery, servitude, engaging in criminal activity, begging, benef begging benefit or other financial fraud, or child trafficking. Okay, so there's another one. You might have heard of um, the word trafficking as well. It extends to the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of children for the purpose of exploitation. Exploitation can be sexual in nature, but like I said, it can be for drugs, it can be for begging, it can be for all kinds of things, okay? And sexual exploitation of children. Child sexual exploitation, which is CSE, is sexual abuse where children are sexually exploited for money, power, or status. It can involve violent, humili humiliating, and degrading sexual assaults. Young people are persuaded or forced into exchanging sexual activity for money, drugs, gifts, affection, or status. At the bottom of that slide there, is the CSE helpline number, which you can ring, which is actually specific for this purpose, where they can also give you um, guidelines as well, not just um, uh, help or where you can report it, but also signs, you know, for you to have a look at as well. Child sexual exploitation, like I said, does not have to be physical. It can be online as well. And more and more sexual exploitation is actually happening from home, from the comfort of their own homes, thanks to Zoom and WhatsApp and mobile phones and dating agencies and Facebook and all the rest. Okay, so sexual slavery, okay, is something that I mentioned to you already about that Eastern European girl who was forced to come here. She wasn't forced actually, she was groomed to come here and then she was made into a sex slave. That is what it is. It's an umbrella term that covers human trafficking, slavery, servitude, forced labor. Human trafficking is the recruitment, transportation, um, transfer, harboring or purchase of persons for the sole purpose of exploitation. Act means purpose. A trade in human beings, victims are coerced into dependence through debt, bondage, violence, or drugs. They are deprived of personal rights. So this girl actually, did you know her passport was then taken away so she couldn't go back again. Freedom of speech, independence, and self-conduct. So um, that is rife one out there, big one. Indicators of sexual exploitation, victims are forced into prostitution, pornography or lap dancing for little or no pay, deprived of their freedom of movement, subject to threats of violence. No documentation, children 
sexually exploited and trafficked. Let us now look at the physical indicators. Okay, these are very important. And these mainly, I would say, teachers would see when children get changed for PE um, or when they go to the toilet, or doctors are more likely to see these ones. So, indicators soreness, bleeding in genital or anal areas, itching in genital areas. Stained or bloody underwear, stomach um, or headaches, pain on urination, difficulty in walking or sitting, bruises on inner thighs or buttocks. Like I said before, uh, inner thighs, it's very, very difficult to have a bruise on when you fall down because it. it it's not a place where you would normally get um, bruises. So um, that is actually quite a big giveaway. So have, you know, keep, keep a look out on those. Um, we've got anorexic and bulimia we mentioned already. And then let's look at behavioural indicators. Chronic depression is a behavioural trait. Inappropriate language, sexual knowledge for age. Now I have got one which I have seen, do you know, I've actually seen everything. <laughs> so this is when I was teacher training and there was a boy, he was four years old. He did not know how to spell his name, but he knew how to spell the word S-E-X. And that child, later on then I found out that his mum was into prostitution. So um, that is one behavioral indicator okay without him even saying anything there making sexual advances to adults or other children i've seen this one as well so you know they've been engaging in pornography i did have a boy who was coming out with all these terms um, in the playground and then we had a chat with the parents and the dad came out with yes he does watch pornography at home and sometimes the child is there Low self-esteem, which happens with all of these abuse, afraid of the dark. Weariness of being approached by anyone, especially the opposite gender. Evidence of substance misuse, like drugs. Acquisition of money, mobile phones without plausible explanation. So whenever a child comes home and they've got expensive presents, well, where the hell did that come from? You know. And um, association with older people, particularly men outside the usual range of contacts. So again, this is an interesting one for doctors and pharmacists to see. So for example, if a, if a young girl comes for the morning after pill and the boyfriend who is with her is an older man, much older, then, and she comes quite often, then there's a worry there, isn't there? So uh, it is usually older men who know how to manipulate young girls. They know all the tricks of the trade, as it was, and the girls are usually innocent. So that's something else to look out for. And phone calls, messages from adults outside the normal range of contacts. So somebody who they may not know, not their direct colleagues at college or school or in their tutor groups or universities, things like that. Okay, right, now we're going to move on to the last kind of abuse. You can tell me which was the fourth abuse that we covered. Neglect abuse. Neglect, well done. I'm glad neglect. you're listening really, really well. Now, why does neglect happen more nowadays, more than ever before? Anybody know? Because the mothers are working. Correct. Nowadays, especially in this country, there is no clear role for a mother and a father anymore. Uh, whereas if you look at good 20, 30 years back in the days we grew up or in our home countries, there's a clear role where fathers go out to work and mothers stay at home to look after the children because they're naturally there giving birth to the children. So they're the ones who have to breastfeed them, for example. That doesn't mind you stop them from going to work, but uh, this is an example I'm giving. So more and more really neglect is happening because in the current climate we're living in, girls need to work as well because of high mortgages and 
the way our living uh, life with it, you know, living life of our lives have, have, have got a lot more materialistic. So the definition of neglect, the failure to provide for a child's basic needs, that's adequate food, clothing, hygiene is a big one, supervision or shelter resulting in serious impairment of a child's health or development. Children who are neglected often suffer from other types of abuse as well. Okay, now another one there is medicine as well there. So for example, I had a child in my um, school and there was a girl, she was having fits in the classroom and I'd phone up the mum and the mum had not given her her medication that day, okay? I had another girl who had constant headaches and the mum would not give her paracetamol, okay? I had another girl who every time we phoned up the mother, she was on holiday somewhere else, okay? She was basically born out of wedlock, this girl, and as a, an accident was how the mother described it when I brought her in one day and said, look, is she not your child? You know, um, every time we found her, the mum was on holiday somewhere else and there were different men coming to collect the child. That is actually neglect, okay? A skinny child losing weight, um, bad hygiene, a smelly child, then that means the mum's not bathing the child, things like that. These are all signs of neglect. Okay, um, here are some indicators. Okay, the poor girl there is locked up in a house and she is neglected in that picture. Okay, let's have a look at the behavioural indicators. Uselessness, lack of peer relationships, low self-esteem, compulsive stealing or begging and then let's look at the physical indicators constant hunger exposed to danger lack of supervision inadequate inappropriate clothing poor hygiene untreated illnesses persistent tiredness so again the parents are not putting that child to sleep on time. A child actually does need eight hours sleep. Another one is they may have constant bags under their eyes like they haven't slept. I've had one of those as well. Um, something really, really interesting, which you may be interested in, is in my school, there were lots of children under the counsellor. And a lot of those children would expose that they feel unloved. I feel unloved. One day I walked into the bre breakfast club which used to run seven in the morning because I needed to actually catch a parent to talk to one of the parents and I walked in and it was a very small breakfast club and I counted there were seven children in that breakfast club who were also on the counselling programs that I had placed them on and they're the ones who had exposed that they were neglected and what is so interesting is that those children, they, they were dropped early in the morning in the breakfast club without any breakfast. So they had to eat their breakfast in the club. They were picked up at about seven o'clock after the mother comes home from work and then ate their dinner. And in the summer holidays, guess where they were in the breakfast club again. They never ever went on holiday either. The mum, poor thing, was too busy working and I say poor thing because sometimes it's not always the mum's fault there may not be a dad around um, in nowadays culture especially and the mum has to go out and work so this is like um, what Priscilla said earlier about um, neglected, neglected um, children because mums are too busy working okay right the other type of neglect becomes self-harm and suicide now you would be surprised or not surprised to hear a lot of children who are looked after 
taken away very early on uh, from their parents because of neglect. They do end up self-harming and quite a lot of them, once they're teenagers, do end up committing suicide. Okay, now in Islam, why is suicide haram? There are two reasons. Um, Allah decides when it's your time to die, not you. Good, good. It is one of the mani mufassil is that Allah is in charge of your destiny. Okay, he brought you to his, this world. It is up to him to take you away. It is up to him. So by committing suicide, you are actually taking in charge of your own destiny okay that is wrong how do we know the other reason why suicide is wrong what evidence have we got up there that's your clue anybody assalamu alaikum hello assalamu alaikum um sorry i didn't present myself my name is amel okay come on then amel what's your answer uh so i think that um it's also because um, it's a lack of trust in Allah's decree as well. Yes, we've done that answer already. The other answer yeah. I'm looking for is something up there. When we get up there, what is there going to be up there? Paradise. You can't enter paradise if you commit suicide. Right. Hellfire is Hellfire. the word I'm looking for. Hellfire. Good. Well done, brother. So up there, like the brother said, Hellfire, there is a chamber. And in that chamber, you will reenact your suicide again and again and again. If somebody takes poison, they will continue taking poison, continue taking poison. We know this already. So we know that suicide is wrong, wrong, wrong. Okay. So anybody who is trying to commit suicide, it is self-harm. Behavior which has a strong suicidal intent you may see somebody cutting their wrists. I came across a girl cutting her wrist and she was doing it on the corner of the table. And I had to quickly bring in her mum and say, look, this is what she's doing. So sometimes psychologically they can do it. They may not realize. I've had others who have jabbed themselves with pens and things on their legs. I've had another one who's taken out their eyelashes. Um, uh, and, and be careful. Do you know children, some children get addicted to um, sugar and coke. These are early addictions which later on then become drugs. Okay, so I've had that one as well. Coke, can't live without coke. Sugar fix to bring them up on a high. Later on, it becomes other addictions like drugs and alcohol. Okay. Amongst Muslim children, later on, it can become caffeine, coffee, or sugar in any form. So keep an eye on that one as well. Okay. Um, none of you, it tells you, actually, doesn't it already? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in Islam, none of you should wish for death because of a calamity befalling him. But if he has to wish for death, he should say, oh Allah, keep me alive as long as life is better for me and let me die if death is better for me, okay? So why do young people self-harm? To release tension caused by anxiety, grief or anger, as a means of communication to tell themselves and others that they need help. Feel as though they have control over things in their lives. To make a real emotional pain they are unable to express okay we talked about emotional abuse being invisible so they can't express their feelings they self harm to show people look at me watch me listen okay um self-harm does not necessarily indicate suicidal intent okay so there can be other forms of um, emotional abuse or other types of abuse which can lead them to do other things as well. It doesn't always come out as self-harm. Okay. Now, anybody who has mental health also is very, very vulnerable. Okay. In an average class of 30, 
um, 15 year olds, 10 are likely to have watched their parents separate, six may be self-harming, seven are likely to have been bullied, one could have experienced the death of a parent. So keep an eye on also mental health type um, emotions that the children show, withdrawn and things like that. Okay, right, that now finishes all the um, abuse, the types of abuse. And now we are going to look at what do we do about it, okay? Now some things that I'm going to say are universal to all professions, no matter which job you are from. And some you have to go and find the local social services and find them and they will have their own forms according to which borough you are from. Don't forget, I will ask whatever questions you want afterwards, answer them. Okay, so dealing with disclosures in school, um, but on the whole, this can be uniform across every profession. These are called the five R's. Okay, now on the whole, I will mention to you that children find it difficult to lie and um, they are more likely to tell you the truth than adults. So that's a very important one. Children are, find it hard to lie and from their body language you can always tell. So keep an eye when you are talking to them, uh, what kind of tone of voice they're using. Are they looking at you when they're talking to you? Are they repeating the same story the same every time you ask them or does it change each time? Because that's an example of lying, isn't it? When the story changes each time, they forget what they've said or they don't look you in the eye. So receive, reassure, respond, report, record. These are the five R's. And I would like you to write these five on your sheets, even though if you don't write all the little writing that's about to come up. But those are the five things that you need to follow on the whole, okay? So receive, listen actively, open body language so that the child can, you're giving them the right environment to speak. Accept and be non-judgmental, okay? If you are non-judgmental, they are more likely to tell you everything and trust you. If you are not, uh, if you judge them, they will close up. A bit like adults, they don't tell people who they don't trust, do they, please? And then we've got TED, T-E-D, tell, explain, describe. Okay, that's what you need to ask the child. Tell me, explain it a bit more, can you describe this? Only after you've received that information and you feel, oh gosh, there's alarm bells, then you go to the next R, which is reassure. You've done the right thing by coming to me is one thing you could say. Reassure child that you have listened in a nice, lovely tone of voice and hear what they're saying. Don't promise though what cannot be delivered. For example, don't worry, I'm gonna lock up that Imam and I'm gonna put him in prison, okay? Or don't worry, I'm gonna sort your dad out and he'll go to prison. Do not promise anything that cannot be delivered. Okay, they are just examples. Then you need to respond next. Tell what you're going to do and do it. Now, under the law in this country, you are allowed to do something about things when people tell you something. If you think there is a danger, okay? So, for example, if a child says, oh, um, my mum points a knife at me every night, it is your responsibility then to respond. You cannot just leave it at that because if that child dies, how will you feel afterwards? Okay, so I know plenty of children at the teenage level or university level where um, their friends have told them things in confidence, like they don't want to live anymore. This actually happened recently they don't want to live anymore and the next day they've committed suicide okay and that friend they told now needs mental health support because he's suffering he was the last person that person spoke to and now what 
he's going to be guilty for the rest of his life that he didn't do anything about it. So be careful here, please, everybody. It is important to respond. You're doing the right thing. You're protecting them. You're protecting their vulnerability. You're protecting them from a future problem that may happen. So report. As soon as possible, you need to, some of your workplaces will have a pink form, which I'm going to come to in a minute, that you need to fill in quickly and give it to the designated teacher who is in charge of safeguarding, okay? Some of your workplaces, for example, may have a practice manager and you will give them the form or you will tell them and then they will do all the necessary running around, okay? Some of you, for example, doctors I know, they need to phone straight away the social service number and directly speak to them. Every workplace has a safeguarding policy in place. If you haven't got this, you need one, okay? If you need help in writing one up, I can send you a template. It's very, very important. In that safeguarding policy, which is given out to all your staff, it should be written in there how they should report that safeguarding issue, okay? I'm making this crystal clear so everybody knows. And then you record facts. None of your own opinions. Facts are when, where, who, and what. When did that person tell you? Where did all this happen? Who did that person mention? And what actually happened? It's all the W's, the four W's. When, where, who, what, okay? This is a sample pink form for recording of child protection information, where you put the name, date of birth, their class, the date and time of the incident, the date and time of writing. There could be maybe a week has gone by where this child had this incident of someone molesting them and then they're writing about it. Your job title, um, what's the pupil's account, perspective, professional opinion, um, and there will be forms like this on the internet that you have to fill in as well through the social services who you contact according to your local authority, your local council. Every form is different, okay? Make sure your report has no waffling in there. It needs to be clear, black and white in there, um, what you have written, okay? And um, this is actually one form which I have got uh, from Essex Council and these are the criteria written on there but again every single borough will be different because even in Essex this is the universal one for Essex but in each region so in Brentwood which is where I worked this is the form we had to fill in for social service the final form where the pink form is just where you report it to your line manager and then this is the final form that has to be filled in for social services and um, this is the one that doctors use as well in Brentwood and Basildon which is South Essex which is where I live but like I said it all depends where you live and there are people on here from all over the place today. Okay I already mentioned all of you should have a safeguarding and child protection policy in your workplaces if you want to email me, because all of you registered today, I can send you a template, but that is needed. In that way, all the staff need to know what to do. Otherwise, they won't know what to do, will they? Everybody also in your workplaces needs training for child protection every two years. Some schools, some places, private businesses are running without that. And it's important, your staff need that training every two years, okay? Send them this video otherwise. Um, or there's plenty around. Get in touch with me if you need it in your workplace, okay? Um, now this is pe people's experience of a disclosure. So many people are really scared, especially vulnerable adults who are kind and caring and they might think oh no I don't want to do that I do not want to 
um, mention that this child is doing this and I don't want to go up to the parents and oh I'm going to get in their bad books because you know the parents from madrasa you may even be their personal friend don't forget people who go in madrasa and stuff or Islamic schools you know the parents as family friends the Islamic community is very small so I'm going to tell you the positive disclosure experiences um, which are um, occur when you do these things in the right way. Young people were automatically believed, and I did say that they are in a state of fitra, some of these children, where they have no sin and they don't usually lie, okay? Um, staff reported the abuse through appropriate channels, and I've told you those appropriate channels. There should really be a form if you are a boss of a place there should be a form that staff can fill in and then they give it to you and then you do the form on the internet for social services okay there should be a hierarchy um the staff member explained what would happen next and kept the child informed as well to reassure them that is a positive experience and then emotional support through the process was provided by a teacher. So, for example, in a school, we've got mentors, counsellors who talk to the child and say, don't worry, you know, you're going to be safe. And then a negative disclosure experience, hopefully there won't be more, occurred where teachers, staff failed to inform the young person of how they would handle the disclosure, leaving the young person in suspense and fearful about what would happen next. So remember, once a child has told you something, they are going to be panicking. Anxiety is going to kick off. So you need to tell them, don't worry, it's all in safe hands. We will do our best to protect you. Some teachers went straight to the parents who were the perpetrators of abuse or who were aware of or enabled the abuse in some way. So be careful there as well. Remember, if you go to the perpetrator, they're going to cover things up, aren't they? Okay, right. That brings me to the end. And I've done that very well in the time limit I had. I did say at the beginning that the one and a half hours was for the training only, but not for the questions, because I cannot judge how long questions are going to be for. So I am now going to do the questions. And... I would like you to feel free to tell me how many, uh, you know, whatever you want to ask me, basically. Brother Tariq, I can see your hand up on the screen. Yes, I've got a question. It's yes. around abuse and uh, reporting abuse. Um, do you feel that the social services have enough resources to handle every single case of some sort of abuse or... Is it right. short? Is there a shortfall? Right. That is an excellent question. And unfortunately, I'm going to tell you the way it is. Okay. Do you know what? I came across a child. He saw his mum's friend, friend hang herself. He saw it himself. This is an eight-year-old. Okay. His mum was on drugs. He was a badly ne neglected child who was actually not very hygienic as well and he also had seen sexual abuse happening in front of his eyes can you believe it he had seen a murder and sexual abuse and he was neglected and his mom was on drugs now you would think that that is enough there to get social services involved okay and i was worried sick about this child and i and i phoned them up i wrote to them i did everything and there was no help given at all because <coughs> they just did not have any money. So as the government is going forward in time, there's less and less money because more and more child protection cases are coming out. There's more and more abuse out there. There's more and more sexual abuse. We know that there's more violence out there, more knife, knife crime out there. And, um, all of these things, the government doesn't have enough money, unfortunately. Um, more money needs to be put aside, really, to protect these people. And just like there's not enough money in mental health or in special needs in schools, there's not enough money in this sector either. 
It's a poor country, I'm afraid, and the government needs to put in a lot more money. Like the NHS doesn't have money either. Okay, so many people don't have enough money. Okay, let's move on to Fasilla, who has got her hand up. Okay, uh, it's to do with um, abuse, yes. physical abuse. Um, in Islam, our male children are circumcised, but in another culture, that can be equally seen as um, like FGM, yes. cut child, and that can be seen as child abuse. Right. Okay. That's so a another good culture. And I know that quite answer very well. Okay. Like I know all the answers on these topics. So, first of all, circumcision is a very, very followed sunnah, very, very important sunnah in Islam for boys. Okay. Some people interpret that it is there for girls as well. But the circumcision that is in the hadiths for girls is not closing up your hole and then cutting it once you get married. It is for a different purpose, which is to, along the same lines for why men get it uh, done, is for um, sexual pleasure, uh, is one of the reasons, and to stop infections. It is a different kind of operation. And this is where people have got mixed up and they've mixed it up with the culture of keeping a, a girl a virgin. And they, they say it along the lines that this is Islamic, but it is not. It is a different operation completely. The FGM is actually closing up their hole, which leads to so many infections inside. Okay. And then that hole is split open once they get married and it damages that area. And that child then is, um, does not like sexual pleasure and it affects them for life. The other one, which I forgot to mention, which is also very, very haram. Did you know that uh, breast flattening is another one? Okay, now I know this is very explicit, but I do need to explain these things sometimes. We all know that men like, um, on the whole, large breast of women because of, uh, uh, nature, uh, large-breasted women make good mothers because of the breast milk. So they look for women who are large-breasted for, uh, you know, that maternal instinct. Okay. Now, um, what is also happening in these countries is uh, breast flattening, where the parents, they put a belt around the chest area to flatten the girl's breasts so that they are not attractive to attract men so their chance of being um their virginity going is minimal that is what is going on and that has a huge psychological effect on those girls because when they get married their husbands don't like them because there's nothing to grab hold of okay <laughs> basically in black and white um so it is not good and um this is a form of harming your body as well. Instead of teaching them ways of modesty. So if there is a girl with large breasts, she does not need to put the belt on. She can cover her chest with her headscarf or loose clothing like an abaya. Instead of that education, there is in education illiteracy and this is what is happening out there. Okay? So there you go, that's another form of... Did I just mention one small thing? It's not a question. In the Japanese culture, they do black breast flattening. Yes. And also, they, they, they start the feet to make them smaller. And so they end up with this club feet in Japanese culture. Because okay, I don't know about the feet, but uh, more important, we're looking at sexual stuff here, okay? Mm -hmm. so breast flattening and but that's a sort of a self-harm it is of course it is yeah. damaging your body harming your body is all self-harm yes definitely okay right can we have somebody else now please because i know the questions are going to go on forever today and we do need to give as many people a chance as possible i can't see everybody on here i'm afraid um so if you can put your hand up ines ines in in us, dear. Yeah. Yes, in us. Yep. 
Go ahead, sister. Yeah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. I just want to mention that you um, you mentioned a lot about the Islamic culture and so on. Yes. And that's uh, actually, I find it that lots of schools around here, they find, they, they, they like um, going around the Muslim children that they are all on uh, under abuse. So I don't, I don't like the way that mentioning Muslims as they always abuse their children. So that's annoying me. It's not yes. like this. Yes, but we, that is why should, yeah. Yeah. I did explain the Islamic thing as well, didn't I? So with each thing yeah. I mentioned, first of all, I don't know if you were here from the beginning, but we, I did mention yeah, I, yeah, I was. This yeah, is I was. In, uh, everyone on here is Muslim. And we had to cover the Islamic side because of Islamic schools and madrasas and imams are on here yes. as well. So I was actually asked to cover the Islamic side. But with each thing I mentioned, I also mentioned that Islam doesn't say this. Islam doesn't say this. So with yeah. Marriage is actually... So it, yeah, it's actually to... Suicide, I they need with the, so. I explained mm -hmm. as well. On the whole, okay, on the whole, non-Muslims, uh, mm -hmm. children, come across abuse more from more than experience because of the Islamic religion a lot of these things don't happen so there is no neglect a lot of mums do stay at home and all that is there in the religion also mm -hmm. the physical violence I explained earlier on as well does not happen in some you're not supposed to leave a mark on your the child's body um, all of oh, yeah. So we've got the example of okay. right can i have somebody else please now um i've got somebody here is that hamira yeah assalamu alaikum um basically as a parent um you know in, in schools they have these um sexual education uh, videos and things like for example year two year six um at the beginning i was against um showing my child but then i was watching a video a while ago um like one of the muslim head teacher was saying it's good to see it because um, for example, say like someone has abuse, um, whether it's a boy or a girl, they would, the child wouldn't actually know whether it's called a willy or a vagina, things like that. So do you, would, do you recommend like we teach our children where these body parts are so in case something happens, like my child or someone else's, uh, they can come back home and tell the parents what's going on? Yes, now that is a very good question and I have done a whole lecture on this topic already. I did it in a mosque, believe it or not. Can you believe it? I did that lecture in a mosque. Uh, it was a couple of months, uh, actually it was before lockdown I did it, and it's on my YouTube channel, okay? I would fully recommend you watch that, and it's on homosexuality and um, all of this kind of stuff, what sh we should do. Now, in a nutshell, um, some of the stuff that they do, for example, like the body parts and things, I find a bit too explicit. They don't need to know names, for example, okay? Um, however, I think it's very important for parents to explain things to the children in a scientific kind of way. Um, there are ayahs in the Quran as well about sexual reproduction, believe it or not. They are there and Arabic children, for example, they would read the Quran at a very young age you know, from the age of five onwards. So if it's in the Quran, it's okay for us to talk about it. However, on a personal point of view, some of that, so those sexual reproduction lessons, especially when they get to year four or five, are far too explicit. Um, they show too much on there and there's no haya at all. You know, they even show a woman giving birth and I don't think a child needs to know that, for example. Um, and they definitely don't need to see real life naked body parts of the opposite gender at that age. I don't think that's right either. So I think the, ch the parents have got a very big duty here to teach their children whatever is in the Quran. So the, the stages of the fetus is in the Quran. Um, it tells you uh, uh, Adam and Eve had children and it's within marriage. That's the kind of stuff in which you tell the children that, uh, uh, you know, intimate relationships happen between 
a husband and wife only a mar within marriage okay um, that kind of stuff you can explain but that curriculum I don't think is good enough uh, I think it's far too explicit um, maybe when when they're very young it's okay but not the one when it when they're year four or five I think that you as parents have got the right to withdraw them but that doesn't mean you don't tell them anything you do need to tell them you can even tell them like and uh, like with animals there's a you know a hen and a, and a, a you know a, a, a egg and it gets fertilized and then it has a chick you can even do it that way so watch that video sister okay Hamira you watch that video it's all on there I've done a whole two hour lecture on this topic Okay, right. Anybody else? Sidra, there's a question on there. My question is, you said something earlier about abuse and how one of the signs is inappropriate clothing. I said one of the signs of abuse is actually maybe torn clothes or smelly clothes that haven't been changed. Inappropriate clothing would be a child wearing sandals in winter. Yes, it will be classed as neglect. Yes, that's I think what the sister was saying. Yes. So, um, inappropriate clothing one of them is it's snowing outside and they walk in with a t-shirt on and no coat okay another one is they have the summer uniform on in the winter another one gosh i had this one as well there were so many children coming in and they didn't have their uniform on and it was always in the wash whenever you asked them or for pe they never had a uniform okay right let me have a look what else is on here do all the schools have the person who can the children can talk to when they have anxiety problems yes the special needs coordinator the senko is the first person you need to speak to she is the head of the special needs children she then allocates where the child needs to go for support so it can be a mentor it can be a learning support assistant in the school or she can get a counselor in she will assess your child first okay so that is the senko um, in terms of sexual reproduction, got a lot of sexual reproduction questions today, and puberty, it is actually in the science national curriculum. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the one, where once you're older, it's different. In the science national curriculum, it's fine. It's some of the explicit stuff, really, that they um, do. Um, I've got another one here. With parents' carers becoming more busier with jobs, for example, or more parents having jobs and a busier lifestyle, when does this sometimes lead to neglect and how to differentiate between the two okay we already know everybody's busy nowadays you know the major things you need to survive okay is warmth and love food clothing okay medicines it's when those four things are neglected that's when there's a problem so yes, you can go to work, you can be part-time workers, but when you come home, you feed your children, you put them to bed, you read them a bedtime story for the love, you don't make them fend for themselves, things like that. Um, you give them love and affection. That if that's then missing, when a parent is working, then there's a problem, you understand? So it's the staple things which need, which need to be there to live okay that's your answer so food clothing warmth and love things like that okay what have we got here how would you be able to tell whether it's lack of resources or low income rather than neglect you can tell believe it or not people who are poor they get unemployment benefit job seekers allowance they get living allowance they get child benefit do they not on the whole you do have enough to live on in this country okay so even if it's lack of income it, that child should not still be neglected because there are even food banks out there even if they don't have any food how many food banks are there now even running in the mosques okay it should not neglect the child that's how you know the difference that's also a very good question and clever people in the audience today it says here clothes and food banks are very accessible nowadays. Yes. Brother Tariq, did you have your hand up? Yes, I did. Uh, one more question, please. Yes. Uh, what is the bigger challenge to 
turn people's lives around? Is it safeguarding issue or is it mental health? Which one's the bigger challenge? It can be both. Any child who has got any abuse of any kind is bound to suffer from mental health. They come together. If a child, for example, is not having food and is suffering from emotional abuse, of course they're going to have mental health problems, aren't they? Because it's linked, isn't it? Whatever happens on the outside of your body has an effect on the inside. Our brains are connected with the rest of our bodies. So any type of neglect, physical violence, uh, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, of course it's going to have an effect on our mind, big time. So they both come hand in hand really. Except if you've got the gene for mental health genetically, it definitely is going to have a bigger impact on your mental health. Um, so we've got to keep that in mind as well. Some people will be more susceptible to getting mental health because of their genetic makeup, for example, as well. Okay, very good questions. Right, I've got another question here. If, if the parents told their children, I, told, I want you to be better than that child, or to put pressure on them to do 11 plus, for example, which from the parents' view is good for their future, is that kind of neglect? No, that is not neglect, but you know, I mentioned about limiting beliefs earlier. That would come under that category. So if you watch my Slam Channel program, I actually talk about too much competition here. So if there's too much competition, which will put the child beyond his capacity, then that comes under abuse. So for example, I would give you a very, very good example, which I have seen myself. There was a child, the poor thing was special needs, he was dyslexic, and the mum was Muslim, and it was 11 plus, 11 plus, because everybody else are doing the 11 plus, and you've got to do better than so-and-so's family, okay? And I said to the mother, he can't do it. He's special needs, special needs, he doesn't have the capacity don't do it I said no no he's got to do it I want him to do it I know he can do it put him through to the 11 plus he failed and then what that is that not going to then have an effect on his mental health and his self-esteem is that not going to put his self-confidence down he felt useless oh I didn't do as well as so and so I let my mum down I didn't please my mum and then he had to have mentoring so look at the capacity of the child can they do it then yes that's fine put them through it if they have not got the capacity then that is abuse that is abuse especially if they're vulnerable special needs suffer from mental health don't put why put them through that trauma your child is different allah has made everybody different and everybody has good traits somewhere which they can do okay what are the rules regarding to discipline in islam Okay, the rules for discipline I did mention at the beginning. There are very few rules to discipline. One of them is to do with prayer. It says that your child should pray up to the age of seven. And if they're not praying by the age of 10, then you can beat them lightly. Beat them lightly means you do not leave a mark. Okay. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never beat his grandchildren. So there is a classic example. It is there as a deterrent to, so that they do their salah. It is just merely there as a deterrent so they get worried and they do their salah. And then it doesn't need to be done. That is actually the, um, what it says about children. In terms of um, women, Yes, it does say in the Quran that if they don't listen to you, then you can beat them lightly. But we must not forget that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu showed us a miswak stick and he demonstrated with that. Okay, that is nothing. You cannot hurt anybody with that. You are still not allowed to leave a mark on the woman. It is there again as a disciplinary. And some dis disciplinaries are good. 
if you look at the olden days in schools, teachers were allowed to give the slipper, teachers were also allowed to cane children. The discipline was wonderful in schools. We never had any children answering teachers back. They always did what they were supposed to do, okay? As soon as the cane went, everybody knows that children became more badly behaved in schools on the whole. So some disciplinary is there only as a deterrent. How many people went and got the cane in schools when the cane was there? Very few. People were scared. They were not going to do anything bad just in case they get that cane. Okay? It is there as a deterrent only. It does not then have to be used in the first place. Okay? And lots of things in Sharia law, like if you steal, you get your hands chopped off. But because of that rule, you don't do the stealing in the first place. You understand? So we have to understand the context, why the rules are there in Islam. Um, disciplinary is good and you never do the bad to even get to that stage because of the discipline. Doesn't mean it needs to be used. Okay, right. Um, Fasilla, you had a question. Yes, um, have you seen the increase in the Muslim community, the increase of domestic violence and child abuse? I'm afraid to say I have could be because of reporting methods as well have improved and awareness. Uh, more than that, I have seen couples more uh, in toxic relationships, narcissistic relationships more <coughs> in the Muslim community. Um, yes, less with children though, um, but that could like I said, more awareness as well. And people are becoming stronger and the police are also coming out. With all these characteristics, if they're <coughs> coming across it, then they need to go to the police. So if you come across all of these as an adult, all of these are under the law as uh, abuse as well in, at the police stations. And, okay, the questions are coming in, so I'm going to stop there. There are two or three more. Do you believe the abuse in the Muslim community is occurring because people are not following the Islamic legislations that speak against abuse? Yes, yes, yes is the word for that one. Yes, the answer. If they followed Islam, they wouldn't be doing any of that. And believe it or not, where I have seen abuse within a couple or with children, it's always because at least one of them is un-Islamic. They don't know what the Islamic thing says. They don't know what Islam is. Many, many couples, there's always the one, the perpetrator is always the one that is not Islamic. So obviously they will have satanic qualities in them because they're not practicing. They're the ones always. That's what I've seen. And also, if any parents are doing this, they don't know this song. So yes is the answer to that one. That's a very good question. Right. Um, do I have to do this course every two years? Yes, you do. Because every two years, everything changes. Just from the last one I did, I um, have done this one and I've included at least seven more things. Like the sexting and the sexual slavery and the trafficking and the knife crime all that is all new so every two years the law changes and also new things are included in so yes you should do the training every two years i do do this training every two years for your information okay if you want to keep up to date with what training i do then you need to either subscribe to my youtube channel or you can like me on facebook or Instagram, for example, follow me and then you will know. Um, sister um, Sidra, I just want to ask you, you know the YouTube, is that under your name, Sidra Naim? No, it's under Sidra Kadir Naim. That's also in the chat, but I'm going to write it again. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Um, if you subscribe, every single video that comes up on these kinds of topics, you will get a message about uh, my Islam Channel 1 on limiting beliefs, which was also to do with abuse will go on there over the weekend as well. Um, and there's so many others on there, all on special needs. Special needs is my speciality. Mental health, special needs, autism. I've done training on autism a couple of weeks ago, dyslexia. Uh, there's gonna be one on uh, dementia, ADHD as well. 
um, and I am an Alima as well, so I know the Islamic side of things as well. Uh, like you just saw now, I knew many things to do with the Psalm as well. So. Um, and yes, there will be free courses. I've got another question. Yes, I will. I always, for Ikra Learning Centre, I do teacher training every year. Teacher training course coming up in January, um, where I will teach people who are not qualified teachers on how to teach, how do you engage the audience, how do you use resources, how do you use visual methods to teach, how do you get up and do a speech, a presentation, to be in there, the different styles of learning, the different ways in which a child um, uh, learns as well, all of that I will be doing in January so um, like I said again you need to follow me on Facebook and everything will come on there. I know everybody's going to really be interested in the teacher training. Can wow. you who are interested in teacher training also email me then I will send you the Zoom links first to get because it's the top hundred that I choose. Because you came on this training some of you may be interested in the teacher training I'm going to do in January. So please, can you email me as well, if you're interested, and I'll send you the Zoom link first. Right, I think I'm going to stop now. I don't think there are any more um, questions. Um, There's okay. one more there for you. No, no longo, yes? No longo, yes. No longo, so what's the question? Sidra, I've got a question for you. Now okay. you mentioned you do stuff with special needs and yes. I'm intending to uh, to become a Senko. How do I go about it, please? Can you email me no longer? Because that's a long answer. But basically, okay. you need an extra degree. So you've got a degree already. Are you a teacher? I'm a teacher, yes. I've got a postgraduate as well, yes. Right. If you've got PGC already as a teacher, then you need, yes. a, you need to do a master's, basically. Master really? Yes, you do. One year. Yeah. To be a saint. Because it's a specialist role, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Sure. All right. Thank you very but much. It for is another degree. Today. It is a higher degree, master's or MA, you need to do. Okay. Yes. All right then. It's not just experience. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. How to get registered to get the certificate? I will send you one. I have got a note of everybody who came to this training. Sidra, would schools recognize this certificate? Yes, they would, yes. Because I am a teacher. I'm a teacher, you see. Yes. Yeah. Right, can I have now Longo? Right. Actually, my name is Amina. Um, okay. You've mentioned giving certificates. And as, as I'm saying, this is not my real name. This is a title because I had twins. So how are you gonna give certificates when some people have not used their actual names? Um, but I'll tell you what you can do. If you can please personally message me now in the chat and give me your real name and your email address, please. Can All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, but it's something I felt very sensitive because I'm a supply teacher at the moment and yes. I needed this to be you know, renewed yes. all the time. Yes. yes. Okay, I had another hand up, Anissa. Anisha, you had your hand up? Yes, um, I'm really sorry. I'm also somebody else. Um, so, and this is really important because I, I need, I'm okay. going back to work. Okay, so can you also personally message me on this chat, your email address and your name you want on the certificate, please? So on, on the chat now, um, yes. I put my yes. name down. Yes, right. Essex dot. Essex. Dot, dot, yes. Mind and spirit. Mind and spirit. At yahoo.com. At yahoo.com. Jazakallah. Okay, I've got a question here from Alia. Yes, sister, I just want to clarify something. Um, so if I, if I get this certificate, is that sufficient enough? Um, it is, for, it is. What, what is your profession, sister? I actually run a Saturday Islamic school. Oh, this is for, this is fine for, for, for Islamic school, definitely. So I don't have to go for another training? Then no, you don't. This is sufficient because this was catered for, originally okay. catered for Islamic school. Okay, um, right. I think we do need to finish now. Um, 
Thank you very much everybody for coming. I think you've been an absolutely fantastic audience. You really listened well from what I saw. The questions were very relevant and um, you've all done really well. That was quite in-depth training to be honest. So you're, you're fully covered now and I will email you your certificates. Okay, so Jazakallah Khair. Um, Jazakallah. That's okay, Jazakallah Khair everybody. Thank you very much. Yes. 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 Yes.